Hello everyone and welcome to the Festival of Creative Operations. It's my great pleasure to introduce our Festival Chair, Kevin Bricato. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Alicia. Hello, friends, and welcome to our first ever Festival of Creative Operations, where we're virtually celebrating all things creative operations. As Alicia had mentioned, my name is Kevin Brucato, and I'm the VP of Creative Operations at Prudential. <clears throat> now, first and foremost, I hope that everybody is doing well and staying safe. One of the few benefits of this event being virtual, no masks or social distancing will be required. So you could really sit back and take in all that the festival has to offer. So today we're gonna to move quickly through a jam-packed agenda. So I wanted to get things started with a few housekeeping items. To create a fully immersive experience for you today and to make you feel that you're actually attending the conference in person, we're leveraging a new technology platform called Hublio. So <clears throat> we're gonna be living in Hublio most of the day. So to ensure that you're a successful experience, please take a moment, familiarize yourself with the tool and figure out how to navigate the interface. I wanted to give you a few quick tips. Your home page is the gateway to the many different sections of the platform. Some are more informational, such as, you know, you could see the day's agenda. You could look up uh, some of the bios for the different speakers. Uh, you'll see a sponsor section where you could get more detail on the sponsors of the event. Others are more interactive. So definitely be sure to check out the competition section of the platform. Here, you could take part in a variety of different contests where you could win all sorts of different types of prizes. While you're in the competition section, be sure to download your vendor passport. This is your key to discovering the latest tech solutions and it'll give you an opportunity to actually win 250 bucks for a charity of your choice. There's also a lounge icon where you can join industry roundtables for unmoderated chat and networking throughout with other attendees at the conference. And visit the social tab as well because you could share your thoughts, feedback, highlights and photos even of how you're enjoying the festival. Now, most importantly, and pay attention to this part, to submit questions during each of the live sessions, you'll need to find and click on a small icon of a hand with a finger pointer. So it looks something like this, and this is my finger pointer. Here is where you can submit your questions to the presenters. Throughout the day, I'll be monitoring this section, and at the end of each session, I'll ask the presenter to an answer as many of the questions as time will allow for them. Now, when each of the sessions end, you'll need to go back into the platform and find the ne next session that you're interested in, and then you'll need to join it one more time. And last but not least, if you really find yourself lost, don't sweat it at all. We're here to help you. On the main page, there's actually a chat bot at the bottom of the screen, which is a quick way to get help from the Henry Stewart team, and they could re re course correct you on how to get in. And before I hand it over to our headliner, there's one thing I'd like to mention to this group just for us to reflect on. See, it's usually at this point during the conference where I actually look out into the audience and I engage with the audience and the attendees on the topic that I find relevant for the day. But this time, you'll see it's very different. This time, instead of seeing each and every one of you, it's just me, my dog sitting here, my laptop here in my house looking at this screen. So that's the exact point that I wanted to make for you guys today. Things are, and they're going to continue to be very different. Work as we know it, it will never be the same, and it's forcing companies to scramble and try to figure out how to be flexible, agile, and to adapt and accommodate to these new ways of working. This, my friends, is exactly the value that we in creative operations bring to our organizations. It's what we've been talking about at this conference for the past few years. It's our value proposition, and now it's really our time to shine. You know, as lifelong learners, it's wired in our DNA. We've talked about that previously. You know, we acquire the new skills that are necessary to help our teams address the needs and opportunities that are created <clears throat> to help with these new ways of working. We build the infrastructure or the operating envi environment where team members can adapt and experience a better way of working through the enablement of technology. We create what we call the work experience. You know, this enables modern work to happen. This is work that's focused not just on the process, but on the desired outcomes as well. So give that some thought. Try to figure out how you can help your company support these very new and very different ways of working. So with that, I thank you for joining us today. It's now my pleasure to hand it over to our headliner, Melody Henderson of the Curly Girl Collective to tell us about the power of community, the intersection between passion, creativity, and execution. And remember to post your questions in the Q&A section for Melody. Thank you and enjoy the festival. Over to you, Melody. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. Uh, welcome to the Festival of Operations. I am so excited to spend the day with you virtually. I'm going to share my presentation. So today I'll be talking about the power of community and really that intersection between passion, creativity, and execution. And I'll be talking about these three pillars and how they truly um, play a role in terms of how I was able to create a global community of over 200,000 people. But first, I guess I should tell you a little bit more about myself. <laughs> My name is Melody Henderson. I am a creative director based here in New York City, uh, Brooklyn to be exact. And this is me. This is me as a young, innocent, full of creative potential child, where eventually the crayons and Lego pieces turned into Sharpies and Photoshop files as I embarked in a career in advertising and tech. So throughout my career, uh, I've served as creative leader for numerous clients across numerous advertising agencies. I've had the pleasure of uh, impacting brands globally, everyone from BMW to L'Oreal to Citibank. And most recently, I was a creative strategist at Facebook and Instagram, focused solely on small businesses, which is a perfect segue to what I wanna to talk to you guys today about. Um, and it's really about a small business that was born out of passion. And that would be the one that I created. I co-founded Curly Girl Collective. And we are creators of Curl Fest, which is the world's largest natural beauty festival. And our mission is to celebrate, educate, and empower women of color with naturally curly hair. And in doing so, we are really redefining what society's definition of the beauty standard is. So a quick poll. <laughs> So for those of you um, who are logged in, on the right side of your screen, you should be able to see an area where you can enter. And I want you guys to play along with me. I want to know how many of you have ever had a bad hair day. And it might be today virtually, but we can't see you. <laughs> but go ahead and, and, and let me know. Let me give you a couple seconds. All right. Okay, so it seems as if the vast majority has had a bad hair day. Now, I want you to imagine that feeling, right? That feeling of less than, that feeling of not quite feeling um, accepted or comfortable, that lack of confidence. Well, essentially for a large majority of women of color, this is their experience on a daily basis as we sort of contrast what society defines as beauty. And just for a little context, uh, black women historically have chemically straightened their hair to conform a bit more to the European standard of beauty. So you went from curly hair to bone straight hair by a chemical process. And oftentimes um, they're also faced with discrimination based on their hair when they wear it in their curly state. So whether it's a newscaster being fired for wearing her hair in its natural state, or young girls from South Africa protesting to be able to wear their afros to school, or most recently, a high school wrestler who was forced to cut his locks or forfeit the game. So there is this worldwide unjust, if you will, for, um, and it shows up professionally, it shows up politically, and obviously it shows up personally. So much so that a law was passed in New York State that makes discrimination against natural hair illegal. And, you know, it's been actually rewarding to know that my business 
that we have been contributors in creating this change. And it's become increasingly evident that we need a platform. We need a platform to allow us to support and uplift our community. So we talked about what the problem is. We know what the problem is. And I wanna pivot into what the solution is and talk about how we landed on a creative solution, that real intersection between passion and creativity. But I'll give a little backstory. So back in 2010, um, I decided to stop chemically straightening my hair. And what I learned was that I actually needed to learn about how to handle my hair. I know it sounds crazy, but for wearing it straight for so long, it became this new journey of discovering how do I deal with textured hair. And back then at the time, there weren't a ton of resources. There wasn't a ton of conversation. You didn't see myself um, in media. So you really find yourself looking for ways to get information, ways to get support. And I actually was added into an email chain and it was a community of about 17 women or so, all whom of which were women of color and had naturally curly hair. And you wouldn't believe we talked about hair all day, every day. <laughs> we talked about uh, styling techniques and questions of how should I wear my hair to an interview, um, products, what works, what doesn't work, different textures, whether it was wavy or curly or coily. And, you know, it was friends of friends and it grew over time to about 50 or so. And we realized much like we are today, everything was digital. And we thought, what would happen if we just got together in person? So my business partner, um, well now business partner, then friend, decided to have a little get together at her house. And that in-person gathering was amazing. It, it, it just transcended a different way to be able to connect in person. And at the end of it, we tried to figure out how could we recreate something like that on a broader scale. The feeling that we all got who attended, we knew that there's probably other people out in the community that would benefit from an environment like that. So, a few of us from that very same night, uh, we came together and soon after, I would say maybe a month or two, we formed my small business, Curly Girl Collective. And myself and my four business partners, uh, we really set out to create a community that is based on creativity and innovation. And we, would host small events, about 200 people or so, and they were great. But as our community started to grow, we really had to figure out how could we grow with them. And that is when CurlFest was born. So in 2014, um, CurlFest was created, which is now the world's largest natural beauty festival. And it's really aimed to uplift and support women of color with naturally curly hair. So this is a slide from uh, 2014, where we came to the park and had this big gathering. It obviously allowed us a little bit more space than, you know, a, a Chelsea, a studio in Chelsea for 200 people. And this year about, I think it was maybe like 800 people showed up just to celebrate and uplift one another. Um, we had felt like we really had reached the, the height of success. So if you fast forward to 2019, this is what CurlFest looks like now. We garnered 40,000 people from around the world, everywhere from South Africa to Paris, to Brazil, to Switzerland, to Brooklyn, <laughs> to New York. And everyone gathered with a very much single-minded mission. 
And that was just to celebrate us exactly how we are, right? So our business is, is rooted in hair, but it means so much more than that. It's really about creating a space that's inclusive, creating a space where you can show up just as you are. And, you know, we went from our humble beginnings of a small gathering in uh, our friend's apartment to a basically magic at scale. And our community gathers every year in the park for one day of magic. So I'll let you guys experience a little bit of it. was that they would see us next year and obviously things are quite different this year but you know what we as we continue to sort of build and foster this global community that we were able to create and really start to disrupt uh, the beauty space the industry the industry actually started to pay attention and pay attention to a historically marginalized uh, community and we received amazing um, press and recognition from every major news outlet, from ABC, uh, Nightline, to New York Times, to Forbes. And it really was validation, right? It was validation that we were being seen. It was validation that what we had created was actually needed. So we talked about, um, the problem, right? And we talked about what our creative solution was. And now I wanna talk a little bit about the execution of it. So I look at it as when you have a creative idea that's really fueled by passion, the next natural step is the execution of it. So you really can't have a great idea without production and you can't produce anything without a great idea. So I really look at them as coexisting and it's really, you can't, you can't have one without the other. So how did we get here, right? How did we get to a place where we were able to create a global movement? Uh, when we scaled from about 800 people to 40,000 and expanded to New Market in Atlanta, and it really became clear that what we created was needed. That Curlfest actually had become something much, much bigger than the five of us. And it was a um, really serving a higher purpose from where we started out, right? This small idea, and it, it just sort of took on a life of its own. But we had to be ready for that. Um, we had to really figure out how could we align with partnerships. Um, essentially, we work with every beauty brand that has anything catered towards textured, curly, coily hair. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be able to build a, a community, a, build a connecting point that, um, you know, before you probably wouldn't have been able to reach this many people. So part of that is being able to build a support system, right? And most importantly, we were listening to our audience and figuring out what did we need to do to service them and what were their needs. So when we talk about execution, 
I really talk about the process that you need to put in place to be able to bring an idea to life. And I, I think these principles actually transcend in any capacity, any idea. If you can start out with a purpose, really thinking about what's driving it and being true to that, that is the first step. First step, knowing what's the purpose. Why are you here? What are you doing? The next is the foundation. And by foundation, I mean really building a strong foundation that allows you to grow and to scale. So part of that is being able to think long term, being able to think beyond what you're doing today, beyond what you're doing next week. Now, in truth, we actually did not have the foresight that um, Profess would take on the life that it's had, that it would scale um, as quickly as it did. However, we knew that we had built foundation, we had laid the foundation that allowed for us to um, take the ride that, that Profess took us, has been taking us on. And then the next one is support, right? So I think so much of um, creating, marketing, it's around a support system. It's very rare that you do anything in this business by yourself. So it's really important to think about who your partners are, what support do they need, and what support can, can, can you receive from them? How can they help you elevate and execute your vision? And the last is creativity. So are you approaching the problem with a creative solution? And I know, you know, we use the word creativity and creative all the time, but I like to think of it as, does it feel fresh? Sometimes it's instinctual. Sometimes it's, it's hard to articulate when you have a great idea and you know it's a great idea. But I do think when it's grounded strategically, when it's grounded in passion, when you have these other elements in place of purpose, foundation, and support, it makes it very easy to get and land to a place where you have a creative, uh, innovative idea. So I would say, you know, having these elements in place are really what helped us and aided us to be able to build our global community. And I guess the biggest question is you fast forward to 2020 during a global pandemic, what does the world's largest natural beauty festival do when you can't have large gatherings? You can't have in-person events. We pivot, right? And I, I like to say, um, amongst other things, that pivot is really uh, sort of the theme of 2020. And I think it speaks to kind of how we need to move forward um, in the future as well. Being ready and being prepared to pivot. Because um, throughout uh, our entrepreneur experience, our entrepreneurial journey, we've challenged ourselves. We've challenged ourselves to create innovative experience for our community. Um, and it's really important to be aligned and have a pulse, have a pulse on what the need is because I believe that is ever changing. And if you're leaning into your audience to guide you for what they need, I believe that the end result will always land in um, success. So part of our pivot is uh, September 19th, a few weeks from now, uh, much like we're doing today, we will be having the first ever live ProFest virtual summit. Um, and we're super excited to be able to really see our audience again, right? To be able to build this virtual experience where we can service our community, we can educate them, we can inspire them, fellowship. Um, and, and, and it's new, you know, it's new and it's not going to be perfect. But what we do know is that the passion is still there. What we do know is that the foundation is still there and we're confident that it will be a great experience. Because if 2020 has taught us nothing else from a business perspective is that you really need to um, learn how to 
to build that strong foundation that's going to withstand and that it's grounded in a big idea and then having the passion to truly continue to fuel it as the and the and the infrastructure right the infrastructure to really execute it i think those elements are such a key a key to to success so i hope that you've enjoyed my session i hope that you leave here today um, as a whole inspired um, I hope that you're inspired by the notion that five female entrepreneurs were able to create a global movement from our living room floors um, with this lofty goal of, of sort of changing the world. And I hope that you're inspired to, to embrace that notion and the possibilities that, that await. So I will, I believe we have a little bit of time um, for some questions. I'm more than happy to answer a few live questions. If you go on the right side of the screen, I believe, you'll see a little uh, box where you can enter. Great stuff, Melody, thank you so much. We do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, I will, this one's a two-part question, so I'll do it in two pieces for you. Okay. How do you foster a sense of true community and keep the momentum going with the new remote ways of working? Good question. So I think one of the things I actually didn't talk about um, is our online presence. So part of our 200,000 or so uh, community, some of it is actually grounded in digital. So that's Instagram, that's Facebook, LinkedIn, our email subscription. And although we have our tent pole event of CurlFest, we are in constant communication with our audience throughout the entire year. So we were able to uh, plus up a few digital experiences throughout this time. We've asked them, you know, what questions they have, how can we serve them, how can we support them? And I think that is part of the key, is during this time not to forget that we all need to still connect. We're just connecting in a different way. Great. Uh, the second part of that was really, which I think you answered a little bit, was have you found that social media is the, is the driving force behind this? Yes, 100%. Um, I think, you know, to, ask, to be quite frank, our business all started on social media. So in a way, it's almost like we're going back to our roots in the sense that how I even started and, and, and found people were being added into this, you know, email chain. So I think social media, I wouldn't put all of my eggs in that basket. I'm a proponent that there is time for both to sort of coexist. But a lot of it really is um, being able to lean into that and figure out how do you have it so both um, support one another. Great. Okay, another question from Melinda. Do you use agencies or an agency to help with promotion, marketing, media plans? Uh, hi, Melinda. Um, actually, so my background, because I was in advertising um, prior to starting this business, a lot of what practices that I put into place that have garnered success is everything that I've been doing over the last 20 plus years. <laughs> So most of, um, we're lucky that our skill set between the five of us, most of, most of what we do from a marketing and creative standpoint is in-house. I will say as we um, expanded, like we, we expanded to a new market last year to Atlanta, every other year prior, the past six years had been in New York we realized that we needed to tap into a different audience that we hadn't tapped into. So we got a support system to help us do some targeted ads to let um, a new audience know we're here and coming to their city. Got it. Okay, Mary would like to know, in the scaling up, do you feel that there's a tipping point where you become so big that you lose the community and, uh, and value add of individual connections? Oh. Such a good question. And I say that because it is one that we ask ourselves on a daily basis, literally on a daily basis. Because even for myself, um, you know, when I showed you that first picture, you could see grass <laughs> on the ground in the park, right? And the second picture from last year, it, you, you just couldn't. 
But what we try to do is still think of it as an opportunity to speak to one person, right? And in doing so, we don't really get caught up on the numbers. Each person that comes to our event, each person in our community comes away with an actual individual experience. So what we try and do is almost segment the festival where there's different touch points. So it's almost like mini experiences within the larger experience. And that's everything from an empowerment stage where we have guests come in and speak about issues in the community. We have a DJ for music, we have photo booths. Every beauty brand has an activation. So that's really how we kind of keep a pulse on making it feel still intimate, but yet welcome the large community to gather. Well, tied in with that, Emily asks, as your community grew, how did you grow your team to support them? <laughs> yes. So, well, what I, what I will say um, is that we are very grassroots um, and we are thankful for the successes that we've had. But honestly, our team is very, very nimble and we're probably a little overworked. But I think the driving force for us is really that passion. It's that person that comes up to us in the middle of the festival and thanks us and says, well, the little girl, she's from Maine, and she said she's never seen anything, about seven. She's never seen anything like this, right? So those are the, the fueling moments that pushes us past. You know, as we pivoted, I believe it was maybe 2017 or so, we saw a major uptick in terms of attendees and now we have support of a production company so we're no longer on the ladder in the park putting up the banners in the rain and then changing in our u-haul to come host our event we now have a support system of a, a larger production company got it and kind of tied in with that is a question from michael on how many people make up gc cgc today so today there are five founding members um, and, you know, we've been very, very, very thankful that we get a lot of people who are inspired and, and actually just want to support us. So that shows up everywhere from an intern who wants to get into this space of creating events and experiences, um, who will volunteer their time and we can give back. Um, and then people in the community, they volunteer all the time to come and help us do all the logistical stuff because I can, you can imagine, it's, it's pretty much a beast to, to, to produce, but um, the founding five, we're still here, we're still pushing through. <laughs> Great, uh, you've been so, so, so kind to answer these questions. Can I ask you maybe one more? Yes, yes, please do. Okay. I love this, this one, guys. Thank you for so the this, questions. <laughs> this, so this one, I think you were, you were taught when you were talking about the importance of, of execution and production. So the, the question that comes in is how has operations helped you creatively? So how, how, um, how is, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, when I spoke about uh, production and creativity going hand in hand, I believe that at its core, and this is even from advertising days, if you have a great idea and you do not have the infrastructure in place to produce it correctly, you might as well not even have an idea because the end result is literally the only thing that people are gonna remember. So I think it's important early on to figure out what the gaps are, to be honest with yourself, where you need to fill them, and really building that relationship with your partners um, to be able to operationalize things. So a lot of the stuff that isn't as sexy as the you know, festival day of are like the project management tools and all the Google Docs and the meetings and, you know, Pretty much, you have to always be thinking ahead. We end Curl Fest, let's say in July, and by August, we're already planning the next year. So you get like a couple weeks off, and then you just have to build that infrastructure again. So I think it's gotten, um, I won't say easier, because obviously we were thrown for a loop this year. <laughs> but I do think, you know, as you build, you should grow, right? You should grow, you should start to think of what's working, what's not working, and be open to shift and, and, and change where, where you see the need. Great, one more question? Yes. 
Okay. So this one, this is a great question. I think we'll end on this one for you and let you off the hook. So this one has to do, this one has to do with, uh, you know, being nimble and agility, but also being able to scale uh, as you have. So Wendy asks, how do you balance being nimble while also adhering to some of the semblance of a workflow process that can be scaled and repeated? Yeah, I mean, in truth, I guess the nimbleness is a blessing and a curse, I'll be quite honest. Um, you know, if we had the capital, we would have a whole agency help, helping to support us and, you know, move us to C-suite level, but we're not there yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, so I think so much of it, when you're nimble, it's that much more important to align on what your goals are, know what your objectives are, and really stay true to that. So it's a constant um, toggle between doing litmus tests. Do we need to do this today? Is this going to serve the purpose? Um, really, really honing in on what our audience needs. I mean, our whole business was born out of servicing a need, right? So that means to fuel that, we have to continue doing checkpoints to see what's needed. So I think the nimbleness, I would say the plus side of the nimbleness is that you're able to move quicker, right? There's less layers. You're able to make those executive decisions because there's no one else to make them. Um, but I would say if you will look at that as a parallel on how we move through um, the marketing industry, advertising industry, and just building creative as a whole, I think it really goes back to um, knowing what the purpose is, right? Knowing what the purpose is, what you're doing and building that strategy that leads to, to, to success, how you define success. Right. I know I said I was gonna let you go, but this is a really good question. We have four minutes left, so I'm gonna sneak it in, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> so what has been your biggest challenge to growing your community and actually reaching women of color? And has it snowballed quite naturally or was there a strategy for the community growth? Mm, yeah. So I will say, I mean, in, in total, we've been, um, it's been 10, 10 years, right? So, but we started Curlfest, which has now become our 10th whole um, experience in, 20, in 2014. And I will say the beginnings, the early days, it really was the growth was organic. It was our friends. <laughs> it was our friends supporting us um, and coming out and supporting us. It was us cold calling businesses, literally going to LinkedIn and trying to figure out, name the, the beauty brand, uh, Fortune 500 beauty brand, figuring out what the email uh, structure was and cold calling them. And it's amazing now that we have those brands reaching out to us, questioning why they're not on the lawn. So I will say um, the community definitely took on an organic growth. And when we, and, and Instagram and, and Facebook actually played a big role at the time because it allowed us to reach people. It allowed us to reach the person in South Africa, even though our event was in Brooklyn, right? And once we kind of got wind of that, that's why I was saying it was so important that although we wanted to have this in-person experience, it was imperative to still nurture that digital experience, right? To still kind of be a part of their lives. So much of our community is, is what drives us, um, you know, and each year it gets harder and harder, but there's this turning point um, where we have gone through the press reception the doors are open, people are there, and we get on the stage to address our crowd, and it never fails. It's chills. It's, it's, it's like, wow, all of these people are here, like-minded, for the same purpose. But each time you do it, you're like, are they going to come? Do you think you, maybe they won't? And the community just keeps building and getting larger. I mean, I think what we're trying to do is really build um, generational change. Right? I think it's an opportunity to um, the little girls that are growing up now to have their experience be different than our experience, the five of us, what we grew up with seeing in terms of um, the beauty standard. Right, So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what's to come. 
Um, and you know, it's been it's been a it's been a good ride. <laughs> Something tells me the best is still yet to come. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna take I'm gonna receive that energy. <laughs> okay, you take it. But Melody, I can't thank you enough enough. This was awesome. I could tell by the questions and the engagement that the folks really really loved and appreciated. Uh, to all the attendees, we know where to find Melody. She's out on social, can't miss her, make sure to show up to her events. And uh, we will see everybody back again in, in about five minutes where we're going to hear from the New York Times. But thank you so much, Melody. Amazing. Thank you for having me. Enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>